<coughs> so we left off with the wrong slope. So just fix that reciprocal. And let's just leave it in point slope form. There's really no reason to go to point intercept form whatsoever. Unless you want the y to look at the y intercepts. So there's our proper equation of a line. And then I already have that here. And that should be the tangent line at square root 2, 1. So, oh, perfect. I'm not going to try to zoom in anymore. All right, well, that point right there they're not letting me click on is square root 2 comma 1 right there. And you can see that it is tangent at that one point, but I don't want to zoom in because it's going to do weird stuff. But that's the right curve with the right uh, tangent line right there. So any questions on that? All right, that's a good way to check. Go into Desmos, check your, uh, did I graph it correctly? And again, you have to type in this parenthesized uh, function of t for x, comma, func other function of t for y, parentheses. And then <coughs> you'll specify your t values right there as well. Um, and of course, x, y uh, equations just graph the way you type them in forever on Desmos. Now we're going to go to look at area. So we just looked at slope, which was derivative. So how does area relate to calculus? Integral. Integral. So we're going to look at an integral. So if our curve was y equals f of x back in calculus 1, how did we get the area, let's say, for x between a and b. How do we get the area between the x-axis and this function? So integral a to b, fx dx. So that should be clear, easy from, not always easy to integrate the function to actually find the antiderivative in calc 2. It was all about giving you really difficult functions to integrate. So calc 2, we made the function really difficult, but area was computed just like this. <coughs> so what we have now, x is f of t, y is some other function, g of t. So what I'm going to do is translate this area antiderivative So one way to think of f of x is y, and then dx. So area is going to be integral of y times dx. And then we need some t values. So we'll go t0 to t1, so initial t value to final t value. And you'll have to figure out. A lot of times I'll just tell you, go from t equals 0 to 2 or something like that. I'll just tell you initial t value, final t value. Other times I might tell you maybe initial x-coordinate and final x-coordinate, just like I did last time, and you have to turn the x value into a t value. So it just depends on how the, the problem is given. So I'm going to rewrite this with t's now. So y is g of t. So it'll look like g of t. Now dx is going to be f prime t dt. And where does that come from? Let's go ahead and do what we always do when in doubt. Let's take a derivative of this equation right here. Looking at this, it makes sense to take a t derivative of both sides. I could take an x derivative, but then I'll have just one on the left. And then, well, what about x derivative of that? There's no x's in there. So I'm going to take a t, oops, a t derivative of both sides. So we have 
dx over dt equals f prime of t. And then I want to find what is dx, so I'm just going to multiply by dt. So I'll move the dt to the other side by multiplying. So we have dx equals f prime t dt. <clears throat> and that's exactly what you see replacing f uh, uh, replacing dx right there. So that's where that f prime t dt came from. So all you're looking at is y dx antiderivative. Except we translated it into functions of t now. You can memorize either one. I find that the first one's a little bit better. Certainly less writing as your cheat sheet fills up. You probably want to use the most concise version of these. So this was area if we went across the x-axis. That's how we did this. So this is area between the x-axis and our x-axis and our function. So what I want to do next is write the area if I'm going to go across the uh, between the y-axis and the function. So we're still going to have t values, so t0 to t1. And all we're going to do is trade the roles of x and y. So this will be area x dy. And then the other version with the g's and the f's. All that's going to happen is the g and the f are going to trade places just like the x and y did. So we could write it as t0 to t1. Ft g prime t dt. So again, I recommend use the one that's written more simply, just x dy. So we're ready for our example problem. So we're going to find the area of the asteroid. And the shape is called an asteroid. And the parametric functions are cos cubed t. That's our x function. And then the y function is sine cubed t. So we could, of course, go over to Desmos and graph it, but we're not going to use that when we graph on quizzes and midterms. So let's try to graph this by hand. So when in doubt, you're going to just create a table of values. So I'm going to skip that part because I'm not in doubt. So when I plug in 1, or plug in 0 for t, I get 1 cubed and 0 cubed, which is just 1, 0. So I'll put 1, 0 right here. And this is my t equals 0 point. Now normally, don't copy this gray down, but normally we would go up like that in an arc. All right. Arc. I think that's what it's called, part of a circle, an arc. <clears throat> Both the x and the y values along this arc are less than 1. What happens when you cube a number that is less than 1? What happens to its value? It gets smaller. Gets smaller. And the smaller the number is, the smaller the number gets when you cube it. So what this is going to actually look like, uh, and of course when we hit the top right here, uh, we have the point 0, 1, and 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1. So we're going to hit that point also. But we're going to 
take a slightly different path to get there, it's going to bend more like this right here. It's going to look kind of like a like an artistic star almost. So if you look at certain artists, they'll draw their star kind of like a asterisk with four points on it. So yeah, it kind of looks like the reciprocal function. That's what we're going to be drawing, that shape right there. So it's going to kind of bend in like that. We need to get decimal values if we're going to want to be super accurate. Turn like a 1 over square root 2, cube that. And whatever, what is this? 1 over 2 square root 2 cubed, whatever. But turn that into a decimal value because I'm not sure where that would be half of a square root 2. But this is good enough for our purposes right there. And then again, we get negative 1, 0. And it's going to be negative because we're cubing. If we were squaring, we'd have positive 1. But we're cubing, so we're keeping our negative. So it's going to look the same over there. And then down to the bottom. And then back over to here. All right, what t value would return me to where we started? pi. So it's the same period as just regular sine and cosine. You're just cubing them. So we're going to end at 2 pi. <coughs> now we want the area of this. I could color it in, but that's that would make it look kind of ugly. So we want, I'll color it in for one second, then I'll erase it. So, ooh. There we go. I'm going to use that one. All right, so we're going to get all this area right here. I'm going to erase this in one second. So that's what we're getting right there, all that area. Actually, I can fill the this guy in. All right, let's talk about symmetry. Can I use symmetry to make this much quicker? So I could do the upper half, double it. Can I exploit even more symmetry? The first quadrant, and then quadruple that. So let's just do first quadrant, quadruple it. So we're really just going for this area right there. So we're just going for the first quadrant. What t value puts us, we got t is 0 for our 1, 0 point. What puts us at the top at 0, 1? What t value? Uh, pi over 2. Pi over 2. All right, so we know our beginning t value, our ending t value. <clears throat> In this case, it doesn't matter if I measure between the x-axis and the function or the y-axis and the function. So you could go either way with your area. I'm just going to go x-axis to the function because that's how we started out doing areas. So our area is going to be 4 times the integral t0 to t1 y dx. And I put the 4 there because we're quadrupling our area. So we're going 0 to pi over 2. Our y function is just right there sine cubed t. Now dx, you may need to scroll up for dx, but I'm going to re-compute uh, it right here. So we have x equals cos cubed t. So dx dt uh, equals 3 cos squared t. 3 cos squared t negative sine t. So we got dx equals 3 cos cubed t, or negative 3 cos cubed t sine t dt. This is very much like a u substitution. You're doing the same, basically the same thing, you're substituting. And whenever you substitute, you're going to change your derivative term as well, your dx term. Yeah.
Yeah, it just comes from our chain rule on the cosine derivative. All right, and I'm going to sub that in for dx. Let's combine. Oops, forgot my four. So I'll bring negative three outside. That gives us a negative 12 integral, zero pi over two. Total I have signed to the fourth. We picked up an extra sign. And then cos, uh-oh. That should be a cos squared t, shouldn't it? Yeah, so how do we deal with this? Case three. So this is our, from trig antiderivatives, I think is 8.2. Unfortunately, we have even power of sine and cosine. This is the worst case scenario. So we're gonna have to do the power reduction, which is also called double angle formula, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna write down both double angle formulas. These are, we used them in Calc 1 and Calc 2, and we use them occasionally in Calc 3 as well. cos squared t is 1 plus 2, no, 1 plus cos 2t over 2, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then sine is the same with a minus. These are very useful. You should either have them memorized or on a cheat sheet. We have a sine to the fourth, so that's sine squared squared. So we're gonna get the, that second term will be, the whole thing is gonna get squared when we make this substitution. Now this is not a u sub, we're not changing variables. So dt is gonna stay exactly how it is. So we're not changing variables. This is just an identity substitution. So now we're having fun. So I'm going to do something a little weird. I'm going to multiply, instead of squaring the first term right here, what I'm going to do is multiply one of those by the second one. And I think we get a 2 squared and another 2. So we're going to have a denominator of 8 total. If you look at all our 2s, we've got a denominator of 8. So that's negative 12 over 8. I'll write out the intermediate step. And then you can tell me why this is a good move to make. I took the twos out because fractions suck and I do not like them. Why is it more efficient to multiply those terms first before I multiply the two negative terms? Middle term cancels. What's the word for that? Conjugates. So whenever you can multiply conjugates, I recommend you do that first. It will be less distribution a headache later on. So we're going to multiply conjugates. So conjugates should make you smile. They're always easy to multiply. Now we have cos squared 2t, and 1 minus cos just 2t, and our fraction reduces to something, 3 halves maybe. All right, so now we're actually foiling, so this is not so bad. Before we'd have to foil and then distribute a second time and then cancel terms or combine terms and that would be way more of a headache. So we got one, now be careful, the second term is cos squared. So 
So we have one minus cos two t minus cos squared two t plus cos cubed two t dt. Now from here we can integrate the first two terms really easy. I'm going to guess and check. So I think the antiderivative of one is t. That's easy to check. Derivative of t is one. Now I'm going to take a guess at the antiderivative of cos two t. It's probably sine two t. And now I'm going to check derivative of negative sine two t is negative cos two t times what? Two t. Times another derivative of two t, which is two. So it'd be double what I want. So I need to cut it in half. I'm basically skipping a u sub with guessing and checking. So we're in calc three. So I'm gonna do that more frequently than maybe I did in calc two. So that is a u sub that I basically just skipped over by guessing and checking. <clears throat> Let's do the second uh, and third antiderivatives separately. So I'm gonna move those over. We'll go over here to the right side compute those and then come back because I don't want to put all this crazy messy antiderivative stuff here. So we're going to compute those and then come back and write our antiderivatives here. So I'm just partitioning this space off right here. So we have integral cos squared 2t. dt We'll deal with this one first, then we'll come back and do the cubed. All right, how do we deal with even powers of cosine antiderivatives? So we can reduce the power with another application of this identity at the top of the screen. The only difference is, wherever you see t, you're gonna replace it with two t. So this is equal to one plus cos of two times two t dt. So where I saw t, I replaced it with two t. So we're just doubling our angle that uh, is in that formula. So that's one half integral one plus cos four t. dt. So any algebra questions on this? So we're doing identity substitution. And this should be an easy antiderivative. Antiderivative of 1 is t. And then we have, I'm just guessing, sine 4t. And then if I take the antiderivative, I'll get four cos four t from the chain rule. So I just need to cut it into fourths. I don't need my plus constant till the very end. So I'm gonna be lazy and not write the plus c until when I combine it all together. Wouldn't it be t minus sign? It's a good question. So I just oh. guessed this one. Right, no So I don't remember, I mean I do, but I pretend that I don't remember if it's plus or minus on the antiderivatives, so I just guess. I don't change the sign, I guess, and then I, and when I'm checking, if I got the sign incorrect, the plus or minus sign incorrect, I'll just change it at that point. Just like, I mean, we just did one that had a divided by two, so we probably could have guessed divided by four, but I just kind of put the easiest thing down I think will work, and then modify it after that. So I always just choose the same plus or minus sign that I had, and then decide if I should switch it later. All right, so that takes care of cos squared 2t. Now we're gonna go to cos cubed 2t. Now we have to reach back and this is case two. So we got an odd power of cosine. Anytime you got an odd power of cosine, you're going to pull the 
one odd one out and then all your even ones still grouped together. This one's kind of easy because your evens are just literally squared. It's just one set of even cosines. So we have cos squared 2t, cos 2t. Now there was a very specific reason we did this. How do we rewrite cos squared of 2t? So we're using our Pythagorean identity, which is cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals one. And then we're solving for cos squared theta. Cos squared theta equals one minus sine squared theta. In our case, theta is two t. So we're just doing all the Pythagorean identity with two t on it. So this is one minus sine squared two t cos 2t dt. What is the last thing, the last tricky thing we have to do? U -sub. It's a u sub. So if you're looking carefully, sine 2t is u, and du is pretty much cos 2t dt. So this is the first time we're doing a proper u sub, where we're changing a variable. Now u is sine 2t, sine to the first power 2t, not sine squared. So our du is 2 cos 2t dt. We do have that extra 2 to deal with. We'll bring it over to the du side. So we get 1 half du equals cos 2t dt. So that half constant bring out front. Now we have one minus u squared du. So our cos 2t dt disappeared. That's all just du times a half. And this is a super easy anti-power rule. We have t minus t cubed over three. Hopefully this is bringing back some good slash bad memories from calculus two. This is all chapter 8, I think 8.2 stuff here, 8.3. All right, so we have our antiderivatives here, and we're ready to bring those back in to our huge uh, antiderivative. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so I'm making mistakes to make sure you're paying attention. You are, that's good. So yes, this was a U antiderivative. So better not just swap letters out. So we got sine to T minus sine cube to T over three. All right. So our cos squared 2t is subtracted, so it's minus 1 half t plus sine 4t over 4 plus the bottom right antiderivative, which is 1 half sine 2t minus sine cubed 2t over 3. So the oh, wait, never mind. negative never mind. was the was a second yeah. second of those, and then the third one was positive. All right, so we took our antiderivative. Everything's back in t's, and don't forget your negative three halves. We don't get a plus constant because we have endpoints. We have a definite integral. So now we're plugging in pi over two and plugging in zero. <coughs> So we got pi over two plugging in first, so it's pi over two minus sine two pi over two is sine 
pi, which is zero. So it's x over two minus zero minus one half pi over two plus sine four pi over two is sine two pi, which is also zero plus one half sine of pi, again zero, and minus sine cubed pi, which is zero again over three. So that is the plugging in pi over two. Now plugging in zero should be even easier because all the signs will turn out to be zero because sine of zero is zero. And you multiply zero by two over four, you still get sine of zero. And all the t's are also zero. So I, oh no. Cosine, no. Okay, so there are no cosine terms. I thought there would be one cosine term that would survive. But it doesn't look like any cosine term survives, so we're going to get a whole lot of zeros. Now I went through every single one, zero in for t, zero in for t, making all the sine terms zero, all the t terms will be zero. So all of them line up to be zero. You want to make sure you look at every term and don't just say, oh, zero, it'll probably be zero when I plug it in. If one of those was cosine, cosine of zero is one, so, but none of them were cosine. pi over 2 minus pi over 4 so pi over 2 minus pi over 4 is pi over 4 which is negative 3 pi over 8 so you should have one burning question. Why is the area negative? Why is it negative? Did we go the wrong way? So let's think about what way we went. So any computational questions before I address the negative? All right, what way do we usually go when we compute area and it's above the axis and it's positive? To the right. Let's think about what way we actually went. I didn't orient our asteroid curve. I did draw it the correct direction. So let's go ahead and I'm going to switch to green. So I don't want to put white on top of this other white. What direction did we go in the first quadrant? Did we go to the left or to the right? To the left. Oh, we went to the left. So we went backwards right there. So that's why we got negative for our area. So most likely if you're doing an area computation and you get negative, you went the wrong way around the outside. So we went, uh, the area formula we were using normally requires us going to the right to get positive area. We went to the left, so we got negative area. We could have swapped endpoints. If we had swapped endpoints, then we would have been going the correct direction to the right, and we would have gotten positive 3 pi over 8. So this was really the negative area because we oriented the wrong way. So negative area is negative 3 pi over 8, so regular area equals positive 3 pi over 8. I probably should have the answer written in my notes, but I do not. This is a quite, quite a complicated example to not have the answer written down. That means we must be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's think about the area. That seems really s pretty small. If this was a circle, our area would be pi r squared. Our radius was one, so that would be 
pi would be our area. Now, if we did the full area, as you can tell, it's quite a bit bigger than the area we got. So according to our computations, it should be about 3 eighths the area of a full of a regular circle. So if we graph it out over on Desmos, basically that would be like 5 eighths and then what's on the inside would be about 3 eighths. It's kind of hard to tell when things are you're going around curves and whatnot. The problem is these are funky shapes. This, it looks sort of circular, but I have a feeling that's not a circle right there. So you, and even if it was, the overlap would not, be, like, the shapes are, con are not just so easy to just subtract off rectangles and circles and things like that. So they're not kind of regular shapes because we cubed our cosine and sine function. So we're going to go to arc length next. So we just did area, we're going into arc length. So I'm going to write down where, basically where we left off in arc length. So we did with arc length, we broke down our line segment into, or broke down our curve into line segments. And we used these little straight line segments and then added up their area and took the limit basically. <coughs> so the length of the kth line segment, LK for length of the kth line segment, it'll be the square root of the change in x squared plus change in y squared for the kth segment. So if we look right here, that'll be delta xk, the change in x from k minus 1 to the k point. And then delta yk is the hor uh, vertical change, delta yk. Now we just use Pythagorean theorem to get the straight line distance with those two as the sides of the triangle. So another way to write this would be, let's see, delta xk, that's going to be dx squared plus dy over dx squared square root well, you know let's just write the final area version for rectangular coordinates or final length for rectangular coordinates integral a to b we use 1 plus we use f of x, f prime of x squared dx. I think that's the formula that we, or one of the formulas. That's probably the most common formula that we used back in calculus two. So what we're gonna do is turn this into functions of t. So we have y equals, or x equals f of t and y equals g of t. Now I'd be overusing the f function so what I'm going to do, instead of writing f prime in here, I'm just going to write dy over dx. That's the same as f prime of x. I just don't want to use f to mean two separate things at the same time. All right, dy over dx. If I use the really ugly version that I have in my notes, the one without the dots, uh, this will require a lot of fraction simplifying always fun. Uh, now A and B are going to disappear. They're going to be T values. So it'll be T0 to T1. We have to figure out the T values. So dy over dx, that's dy over dt divided by dx over dt. 
we gotta square that. And dx was, I'll write it as x prime of t. I should just use dot notation. Let's go dot notation. This is gonna it's gonna be crazy. We don't need to write fractions of fractions. That's not fun. So we have one plus y dot over x dot squared x dot dt. And I'm gonna go back in the notes for a second where we computed uh, dx in terms of t's. So if I rewrite this dx right here, dx would be x dot, that's the derivative of the x function, dt. That's all I'm using right there. So our x dot represents f prime of t. I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Hopefully it'll look more simple. So I'm going to square x dot and then square root it. And now I'm going to multiply it, distribute it inside the square root. So I squared it and square rooted it so I could distribute it inside the square root. Would that add like a plus or minus somewhere? Or? Yes, so I think this requires x to either be positive or it's going to be the absolute value of the derivative. So it requires a particle to move to the right. Because if it moves to the left, you're going to square it and it would cancel out any of that negative movement. Uh, but <coughs> the length, the arc length, doesn't depend on which direction the curve is going. It's always computing kind of the absolute value of the distance you travel. So it's like kind of like your odometer. Mm -hmm. If you'd never illegally roll it backwards, it'll no matter if you go east, west, north, or south, it's always adding on. So it works like that. All right, so I distribute it inside. We're going to get some nice cancellation. So it's going to be x dot squared plus y dot squared. So it's going to cancel the x dot in the denominator squared, and it'll turn the 1 into x dot squared. So I think that's relatively easy. Now make sure your dot doesn't look like a 0.2 power. That would be tragic. And if you want, you can parenthesize. There is an order of operations, and it's super important you take derivative and then square it. So do not square it and then take the derivative. That would be very wrong. So there is an implied order of operations that I've put up with the parentheses. What's that? Yeah, so this can go in your notes. Uh, the other version that the book uses, if that works better for you, f, uh, f of t is the x function, so this is f prime of t squared plus g is the y function, so that'll be g prime of t squared dt. So you can use either one for arc length. I recommend if you're in going into physics and engineering, you probably want the dot version, but whatever one, especially as you're learning, works better for you at the beginning, go with that one.